Hey friends, I don't want this to be just another boring best of 2022 video, so instead, let's turn this into a game. Here is the list of anime and awards for this video. See if you can predict which anime will get which award. There's a link in the description you can copy paste, along with a printable worksheet for those analog weebs. Take a picture and send it to me on Instagram or something, I don't know, let's make anime fun again. So without further ado, welcome to the Weeaboo Awards 2022 weebs, I hope you brought some tissues. Can I ask you something? What are you doing, like, right now? You could skip over this part. Like, oh sure, the one anime that literally everyone has come to a consensus on. He's gonna say it's good, right? He's gonna do it! He's gonna do it! You know what? No. I'm not gonna do it. I'm not. I'm not gonna sit here and tell you that it's good. You don't need that. I don't need that. So instead of hearing me tell you a bunch of things that you already know, let's do something productive with our time together. That's right, I'm gonna teach you something to help you enjoy this anime a little more. Listen to this line from Anya. Anya, I'm gonna explain why this is cute. In Japanese, if you wanna be polite, you conjugate your verbs with the ending mas, like as in to eat, tabemas, to go. Ikimas to come, ichaimas. Daijobu is not a verb, it's an adjective. And what do you say if you want to make an adjective polite? That's right, weebs, you say daijobu des. So when Anya says daijobu mas, that's a mistake literally only a child would make. You wouldn't, and you've been learning Japanese for 30 seconds. Cute, right? There, wasn't that so much more productive than hearing yet another weeaboo gush about Spy Family? I thought so. So, here's your least surprising award, Spy Family. Go hang it up with your other 50 million awards, you fucking whore. Zero, zero, so now, let's move on to something a little less universally praised and hyped. Chainsaw Man. <laughs> uh, okay, no, no, seriously. <laughs> zero, zero, son. While Fall 22 was filled with a silly number of good anime, the summer was plagued with what I'm declaring as the official collective noun, a buttfuck of isekai. My attention always instead turns to the anime that try to do something unique, like Yurei Deco, which has a lot of interesting ideas mixed in with its somewhat on-the-nose premise about social media literally being society. But these out there anime tend to be kind of hit or miss, and Yure Deco sadly ends up the latter because not only are both of its main characters just completely fucking insufferable, this anime fumbles basically every single interesting idea it has. Like, the moderators of this social media oriented society remove anything negative from the network, so everyone is always happy, but then there's the character that can't not be sad when he loses his avatar because it's really, really important to him. Really? They remove all sad things from everyone's conscious, but can't remove anything even moderately important? What's even the point? What are you removing? Waking up late and missing the bus? Jesus. So to Yurei Deco, I present the prestigious A for Effort and also a Literacy Award because effort does not start with A. I appreciate you, but maybe your parents should consider holding you back for a few years. Zero, zero, young. If Yurei Deco was kind of out there, this one is speeding away from us at the speed of light towards the furthest reaches of the visible universe because holy shit dude. My only major gripe with this show is that it's the kind of story you expect to be some kind of interesting metaphor. What with its apocalyptic wasteland and exploding mushrooms and analog to radiation poisoning. Then you get to the end and turns out, uh, no. It really is just a bunch of fucking nonsense. If it ever had something to say, it's been long forgotten. Scribbled on the wall of whatever crack house the writers stayed at to come up with this shit as their plot descended into nothing even remotely resembling a coherent narrative. By most objective metrics, this is a terrible fucking anime, but it's somehow just so insane that it just about works. So, congratulations Sabikui Bisco, you get the several question marks and one exclamation mark award for utter lunacy. Try not to blow all your prize money on even more crack. Zero, zero, 
Shadow House was one of those pretty good anime that got lost along the billion jillion absolute masterpieces that came out in 2021. Well, 2022 is somewhat less dripping from the fat load that was the natural and obvious result of edging all the way through 2020. So hopefully some of you had the chance to check it out this time around. Not that it's the most underrated anime of 2021, that honor obviously still goes to Shuroisuna no Akujo. I mean, look at me, I bought a fucking non-pornographic doujinshi for it. What? What the hell? But it's a shame Shadow House is so underrated because it did have by far the best ending theme of the year. I can't play it, but Reona is now one of my favorite artists. Her voice turns me on. Hey, I'm not afraid to say it. I sometimes think 3D women are hot too. I mean, listen to this. Listen to this. Oh my god, I think I just came a little. What's that? Anime? Oh, who gives a shit? If you like a slow mystery propped up by interesting world building and character development, you'll probably like Shadow House. Simp! Every year, I look at the degenerate house party that is the isekai buttfuck, and I see a sentence of a bookworm quietly sitting there and wondering how soon they can leave without offending the hosts. It's that weird kid that understands and avoids every little thing its peers do wrong, and yet for some reason still chooses to hang out with them. A sentence of a bookworm is the kind of anime that values slow character development and introspection over heavy action and big titties, focusing really heavy on one setting and one character who can barely even move instead of the traditional isekai kitchen sink approach. Hey, I just realized how well this describes Shadow House just now, minus the philosophical shit about the nature of man. Obviously, not for everyone, but I like you, Ascendant of a Bookworm, for you as well as everything you stand for. I was gonna give you the award for best isekai, but then I realized that doesn't make sense. So congratulations, Ascendant of a Bookworm, you get the award for least suck isekai. I hope it doesn't go to your head. Zero, zero, no, no. Isekai Oji-san is the rare anime where the girl sends the main character a picture of her in a swimsuit from middle school, and he deletes it immediately because he doesn't want to get fucking arrested. Finally! Thank you, Jesus Christ! Oh my god. One of those comedy shows that operates on the premise that literally every character is a fucking idiot, but this time completely tearing down the genre of Isekai with it. I don't know if it had anything deep or meaningful to say other than, hey, Isekai is kind of shit, but maybe that's enough. I appreciate you, Isekai Oji-san, so you know what? You get Isekai of the Year award for saying fuck you to Isekai so, so very loudly. Thank you for your service. Zero, zero, hot stop. There's always one anime that would be a contender for anime of the year if it weren't for the alarming amount of anime bullshit getting in the way of the actual story. This year, that honor goes to Summertime Rendering. I made my video on it about halfway through airing when the biggest offense was some moderate wind zest, but how does the rest of it hold up? Well, it turns out there's smoke, there's fire, because there's one character who achieves immortality by fucking his daughter repeatedly over hundreds of years. What? Did I hear that right? Uh, Jesus Christ, here's your cease award, Summertime Rendering. You fucking earned it. Take it along with your cancer award for being holed up on Disney Plus of all things. Now, this might surprise you if you've heard my rant on that last anime, but hopefully not if you're someone who can leave their ego at the door and enjoy a great story for what it is. I loved, fucking loved this anime. I know I go on and on about how fan service ruins stories, but this is exactly why. If you want to do a shitload of fan service, write a story that can take it, not one where it's wildly out of place. <clears throat> summertime rendering. My Dress Up Darling's fan service works because it's about fan service. It's merely a tool to get us in and out of the heads of the two extremely likable leads who have some of the most natural chemistry in any anime this side of Steins Gate. Topped off with an ending that is just plain adorable, and we have ourselves winner for rom-com anime of the year, maybe decade. So congratulations, my dress up darling. Here's your tits on head award for intelligent use of fan service. My cock and I eagerly await your return for season two. Little Ichi. Little Being the king of weeaboos, the reboot of the original wife who was something I was very much looking forward to, if only for the inevitable hordes of new dojins waiting to be written about her. But this sadly appears to be the only thing this has going for her because at no point are you actually presented with the answer to the question, why does anyone involved actually care? It just takes 
taken for granted that each of the characters is in love with each other, but the only personality traits any of them has is that they're each extremely loud, impatient, and stupid. On one hand, all three leads being the exact same inseparable character makes them all perfect for each other, but on the other, why would I give a shit? Why would anyone give a shit? You can't make jokes if we don't have a reason to care about the foundation of the jokes. Jokes, I say, as if it wasn't the same joke introduced in the first 10 seconds and repeated every 30 seconds throughout every fucking episode. And if I'm being honest, I don't think even the show itself cares about it because despite the stylish opening, it hasn't been modernized in the slightest, still taking place in the 80s with fucking cassette tapes and landlines with corded handsets. When is the last time any of you picked up one of these? Some of you probably aren't aren't even old enough to remember them. If you're not modernizing it, why even bother? The original is sitting right there? What purpose could this serve? The only merit this show has is the one admittedly hot waifu, which it doesn't even have the fucking balls to show us naked. A painfully mediocre comedy that no one, not even the show itself, has any reason to care about beyond the aforementioned doujins. So, Urusei Yatsura, you get the Existential Dread Award for the utter meaninglessness of your existence. Maybe the alarming amount of hentai you will inevitably spawn will help quell the pain, or at least that's what works for me. But speaking of existential dread, Made in Abyss. Made in Abyss is one of those shows I really like, but was really, really hard for me to make a video on because it's pretty obvious what it's trying to say. I still did make a banger video, by the way, and you should check it out after. It's a giant sinking pit staring back at you calling you both a blessing and a curse that seizes you more powerfully than any poison and deeper than any illness. And once it gets hold of you, there is no escape because nothing, not even death, is more horrifying than denying the screaming voices of every fiber of your being. Yes, Maiden Abyss is a brilliant metaphor for a feeling many of us understand a little too well. The feeling that there's something you have to do, no matter if it kills you. It's what made me learn Japanese to move halfway across the world, fucking struggle as it was, is. Made in Abyss captures this feeling perfectly with this crippling sense of curiosity that gradually and perfectly pulls you into its awesome, beautiful world. I mean, I want to know what's fucking down there, god damn. So, Made in Abyss, you get the Schrodinger's Can Award for your infectious curiosity. I'd ask you to stop if I didn't know that would drive me insane. Here's what nighttime in Japan looks like. And here's what it feels like. Yes, this anime is drop-dead gorgeous with its muted colors and lo-fi energy. What's sad, though, is that its characters don't quite live up to its mind-numbingly beautiful aesthetic, because make no mistake, this is an anime for people who have never touched grass. I mean, I still kind of like it, but my problem with Call of the Night is that the story itself has never touched grass. The main character, sure, but like, the girl pretends going around and high-fiving drunk Oji-sans is something bold and out there, and it's like, aw, oh, yeah, how does it feel to let go? Uh, no you're literally high-fiving a bunch of barely coherent drunk salarymen. How is any of this bold and kind of out there? What? You learn later that this is kind of the point, but this doesn't make this any less inane. The problem isn't that Yamori needs to touch grass. He's depressed and shit. I get that. He's not the problem. It's that literally almost every single other character and the show itself also needs to touch grass that makes it really hard to emphasize with the Amori sense of alienation because it's just so fucking out of touch all of the time. So, Call of the Night, you get the Diamond Hands Award because it's amazing how one single aspect of a show can prevent it from completely derailing into a horrible train wreck Barely. Take your prize money and invest in some Tesla stock, you dumbass motherfucker. Before I tell you about your boy Kung Ming, I really need to tell you how much I love, fucking love, the band Suyobi no Campanella. The very first time I heard their music, despite not being able to understand a word Komai-san was saying, I knew there was something very, very special about this band. It's just this very unique, once-in-a-lifetime flavor of cool, and I thought if I learned Japanese, if I could understand just a little bit of the language that produced these magical words, I too would find some magic of my very own. If you're not familiar with them, they generally try to come up with a random pun based on some famous character or person and then write a whole song around it. Think of it as the musicality of nonsense. Get on the bus, get on the bus, 
love it. And I love their new singer who debuted last year just as much. She's adorable. So when I realized they were making an anime about a Three Kingdoms general who wakes up in Japan and discovers a sound he'd never heard before that's so beautiful it changes his entire life, my dick got so hard it could have burst through diamond. This isn't just exactly the energy of my favorite band, it's as if this was literally written for me and the first episode didn't just live up to my expectations but fucking blew them away with its style, its humor, and seriously catchy OP. So, the low point of my year was realizing that this show fucking sucks. For some reason, despite being the goddamn title of the anime, it doesn't understand that the appealing part of the story is Kong Ming. Instead, it spends most of its runtime focusing on these random generic fuck off characters that no one gives a shit about. Now, Kong Ming is supposed to be basically perfect, so he doesn't have a lot of room to grow as a character. But that doesn't mean you throw him away. What made this story interesting was getting to view all these characters through the lens of Kong Ming. Do that. Show me the story from the mentor's point of view. That's interesting. Instead, he hides in a corner and cries while we follow these losers around for eight episodes, culminating in a finale that is not only boring and predictable, but also hilariously underproduced. Like, really. This is supposed to be a huge crowd in the middle of Shibuya, representing the consciousness of the Japanese internet. This. Really. This is like 50 people, you can do better. So ya boy Kong Ming gets the ever prestigious Asian Parents Award for Disappointment of the Year. You're far from the worst enemy of the year, but with how much shame you brought your family, you might as well be. Finally out of Weeb Jail, we get easily the most anticipated sequel of this generation. Because it's just that good? Uh, hilarious. It's good, but no, it's not that good. It's because this is the most obvious sequel in the history of sequels. I mean, come on. It's about a demon king that works at McDonald's and his arch nemesis and tsundere lover, the hero who's supposed to kill him. And in the second season, we get to see both of these characters as they struggle to realize that they're no longer the people they once were and discover what really matters to them in this world of peace. It's a reverse isekai slice of life that's deep, funny, charming, and has a shitload of waifu and merchandise potential. How the fuck did this not get a sequel early? It almost seems too sick. No one knows, but we're all glad it's finally here. Congratulations on your most least surprising sequel award, Devil is a Part-Timer. I sense a 25 yen raise and a promotion to season 3 in your future. Whenever the topic of dubs come up, I keep hearing the same thing over and over. Oh. This dub is legendary. This is the good one. 95% of the time, it's not. It's just copium from people who think that just because they liked it means the acting had to have been good. Just trust me, I'm going somewhere with this. See, the thing is, even when the acting actually is good, it still usually falls flat because the other half of the problem is that nothing that isn't Disney ever has the budget for a casting director. Even though Sony paid a fucking billion dollars to have an effective monopoly on anime streaming in the West. What are you, too good to spend money on acting, Sony? Too good to pay the animators, Sony? Too good to pay your translators, Sony? What are you doing with all that money, Sony? Hum? Hookers and blow? I'm not surprised. I don't know how there's so many people that are like, oh, the Steinsgate dub. That's the good one. I swear I'm going somewhere with it. Hello? Okabe sounds like he's 50. How does this not seem off to you? Danu sounds like a bro. That's the literal opposite. Why does Mayuri sound like a cringy weeaboo trying to sound kawaii? Just no. The only one that actually fits is Kurisu. If everyone was like her, it'd be subpar, but at least passable. But they aren't, and it's not. So I found something that should convince even the most stubborn weeaboo that cheap dubs need to be destroyed once and for all. Uchi. そこは最後のフロンティア。そういうなら我々は退散しよう。一応フェレンギ政府に救助の要請は出しておくぞ。別に見られて困る貨物など積んではいないのだろう。that's right, what you just watched was the Japanese dub of Star Trek The Next Generation. That was bad, wasn't it? Hey, what if, and hear me out, we got the most generic Oji-san voice we could and gave it to motherfucking Captain Picard. No? 
Ah, well, shit, her budget is 2,000 yen and a discount supermarket bento. Take it or leave it, idiot. This is what anime dubs are. Again, it's not even the acting. That's fine. It's that they just have completely the wrong people for almost every single role. Captain motherfucking Picard is not whatever this is. So, Cyberpunk Edgerunners, you get the Flying Pig Award for finally convincing me to turn on an anime dub. To be fair, mostly because Cyberpunk felt really really fucking wrong without any fucking swearing, but also because they did manage to find the budget for proper casting, so even though it's technically worse than the Japanese, every character sounds like they actually belong, rather than sounding like they're trying to put on a voice. Remember how it got headlines for getting real actors? This is what impresses me. Not the fact that Gus Fring is in here, I don't actually give a shit, but what this says is that whoever was in charge of casting was paid enough to actually try, rather than just dipping into the same circle jerk of underpaid weeaboos lined up to take any given role for whatever sad dub Funimation or Crunchyroll shits out. Again. Arguably, Mr. Esposito wasn't even the best actor here, but again, that's not at all the point. They clearly put a lot of effort into getting the right people for every role, and as a result, the acting is convincing. I don't know why the basic concept of acting should be groundbreaking, but apparently, I'm the only one with fucking standards. That's right, apparently what a practically infinite budget for an anime gets you is passable voice acting. So, good job CD Projekt Red, I commend you, and I wish you continued success in your new career as an anime producer, because clearly, this whole video game thing hasn't been working out for you lately. Okay. I swear, that's gonna be the last overlong rant in this video. Probably. This might be another hot take for the less cool among you, but the case study of Vanitas is the rare anime that needed way more fan service. Maybe the extreme gay energy emanating from the two leads is the metaphorical garlic to the feminine sexuality in this BL vampire anime, but it's the kind of story that's somehow extremely goofy and yet takes itself way too seriously and really needs some bouncing titties to tone it down instead. Which, to be fair, it does have, just not nearly enough for the kind of writing that went into this. So, congratulations the case study of Vanitas, you win the My Brain Hurts for the one backwards criticism I never thought I'd have to give. Hurry up and take it so I can go lie down. A charming story about this weird little boy that lives alone, turning all of his social reject neighbors into this impromptu little adoptive family to look after him. Cute, heartwarming, and just silly enough. But sadly, there's only enough room for one endearing child protagonist on this year's top anime list, and that's the one with psychic powers. Sorry Kotaro lives alone, you get the overshadowed by Spy Family Award. Go sit in the corner and think about what you've done. Like everyone else, my dick was riding on the edge of my seat, anticipating the finality of this masterpiece when they yanked down the curtain and up the flashlight and said, come back for the final season, part three. Guys. You can't call something the final season and then air it in three parts over three years. That's three seasons. I have a finished video essay about how literally everyone but me is wrong about the ending, just sitting on my hard drive waiting until it can finally be published. That's right. Do you think the ending sucked? Do you think the ending was good? Doesn't matter, you're wrong, and you're just gonna have to wait to find out why. So I can think of no one more deserving of the fuck you award of 2022 than Attack on Titan. I love you, but please eat shit and die. Stories like Made in Abyss are why anime is objectively the best medium. Wildly imaginative, yet at the same time able to capture the subtlest nuance of human connection. And stories like Bubble at the other end are, uh, well, they're pretty to look at. If you asked me to explain the plot of Bubble, I'd honestly have a hard time telling you, and when reviewing things, that is the single biggest red flag. Uh, there's kids in a weird parkour zone, and some mermaid cat girl, and then they, like, do stuff, I guess? Fuck, I don't know. What I do remember is that it's just so fucking gorgeous that even having said something so damning, I'd still recommend it. Want to turn your brain off and be dazzled by the magic of animation? Yes. That's all just yes with a question mark. And then one even bigger one when I realized this was written by Gen Urobuchi. Gen Urobuchi. You're serious. This is like the one anime writer I feel comfortable calling a genius. He wrote this, one of the most unremarkably confused anime I've ever seen. Well, I guess this is why I always talk about the voice of the story rather than anyone who worked on it, because fuck me, dude. Let's just move on to the award. 
Bubble, you get the Macross Award for being jaw-droppingly well-animated, if somewhat shit. <laughs> Speaking of, uh, Geno Tabuchi, though, imagine Psychopaths if it was written to be what a bunch of 40-year-olds think is cool for Zoomer high schoolers. Now, you might think that sounds like complete shit, and don't get me wrong, it definitely is, but it's the kind of shitty that makes it like also kind of good in a way, kind of. Tokyo 24 definitely thinks it's a lot smarter than it actually is, but I'll be damned if I didn't enjoy it anyway. The writing is just ludicrously bad and nonsensical, but it's just well produced and coherent enough that it manages to actually work barely in a completely ironic way. Congratulations on your trash enemy of the year, Tokyo 24. Be careful you don't catch fire from that dumpster you're standing in. Okay, look, I know I just gave trash enemy of the year to Tokyo 24, but having seen Blue Lock, that almost seems misplaced. The difference is that Blue Lock's trashiness is completely deliberate. Yes, a psychological death game battle royale in some ridiculous military complex, but instead of dying, you can't play soccer anymore. I'm sorry, what? You're just banned from ever playing soccer again? How do you swing that? That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. They didn't even have to write that in. They could have just been like, oh, you're not the world's greatest striker. That's penalty enough. But no, no, apparently everything in Blue Lock only works if everything is just the slightest bit stupid. And I'm gonna be honest with you, I agree. I don't think I would be nearly as invested in this show as I would be if it weren't fucking stupid. This is what trash anime should look like. Taking itself so seriously, you'd think it has to be taking the fucking piss, but it's not. A plus job, Blue Lock. You convinced me to finally get into a sports anime. So, Blue Lock, you also get trash anime of the year award. On paper, it's exactly the same, but you and I know the difference. So if Tokyo 24 was what a bunch of Gen Zitters think is cool to Zoomer high schoolers, this one is about what they think is cool to middle schoolers. Literally everything in this anime has to be Zoomer cool futuristic in some way, case in point the main characters are literally social media influencers in space. Some neat concepts, all of which are utterly wasted by trying to appear cool to kids who will be too old to give a shit in about three years if any of them even cared in the first place. Congratulations orbital children! you get the I forgot I even talked about you in my spring 2020 review video award. It's true what they say, in space, no one can hear you give a shit about the most forgettable anime of the year. <laughs> my goal for this video was to try and make as many dick jokes as possible, but I'm gonna be honest, for ranking of kings that just feels wrong, my pick for anime of the season spring 22 is a literally everything I want to see from anime. A thoroughly entertaining, uniquely stylish fairy tale for grown-ups about compassion and understanding. Somehow, also with unironically better action scenes than Attack on Titan. Ranking of Kings gets my thank you award for completely upending the genre of anime and showing us that you don't have to suck in order to be good. <clears throat> Summertime rendering. <laughs> Mob Psycho 100 is even more everything I look for in an anime. Funny, meaningful, not too long, and with a highly autistic protagonist. Yes, Mob Psycho is back and arguably even better than season 2, as hard as that was to top. The animation is certainly better. Seriously, the OP is one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen in an anime. I usually only see them once or twice because like, as king of weeaboos, I don't have the luxury of the commoners to sit around and watch that shit. I have motherfucking anime to review. But oh my god. Watch this and tell me you didn't come in your pants just a little. Seriously, obviously it doesn't just stop there though. A lot of people, read, morons, were shitting on Chainsaw Man for using 3D, ignoring how fucking gorgeous all of the camera work is, even in the slower scenes. But it's hard to not at least kind of agree with them when you see Mob Psycho doing this using completely 2D hand-drawn scenes. I have no idea how much money went into this thing, but it must have been a fucking shitload. In short, if you've seen the first couple of seasons of Mob Psycho, I have no idea why you weren't glued to this thing every week. And if you haven't, what are you doing sitting around watching my stupid videos? Seriously. So yes, Mob Psycho 103 gets the Seriously Award for, hey, stop watching this. Another delightfully trash anime where dude, Sid, makes up random conspiracy shit he thinks is cool and, by pure coincidence, literally everything he says turns out to be real. If you're like me, you might point out that this sounds a lot like Steins Gate, except for the part where this dude is trying to look as dull as possible while being as cool as possible, whereas Okabe is trying to look as cool as possible while desperately holding on to whatever shred of normal 
normalcy he can. So I guess it's like Steins Gate in that it's the exact polar opposite. Oh dear, I should really stop drinking before writing this shit. Well, that's not totally fair. The opposite thing, not the drinking part. I mean, they're both extremely self-aware and extremely funny. That's two things. Although it tries to be a little too silly with a few too many waibus to really flesh out any of the characters or do anything really meaningful, but I feel that's not really the point. It's just plain fun. How many other anime have an argument between two waifus' tits? I mean, come on. Ohayou, beta. Ohayou, ipsira. So, Eminence in Shadow, you get the rare, but prestigious, you remind me of Steins Gate Award. Before this award goes to your head, a reminder that it comes with the expectation of really hot doujinshis. I'll be waiting. Well, now this was a surprise. A girly slice of life anime about a high school band starring a slightly autistic girl with extreme anxiety disorder and running a YouTube channel is somehow the most relatable anime of the season. Although, maybe that's just me. But, you know, there's something just so honest and refreshing about Bochi's social problems that she gets dragged into all this bullshit because she doesn't know how to say no. I don't think anyone expected this to be nearly as good as it is, so there's really only one choice for sleeper hit of the season, and that's Bochi the Rock. No Bochi, this wasn't an excuse to stay in bed, get the fuck up. <laughs> well, 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 if it isn't my 2021 Anime of the Year, come back, have you? Looking for another award, have you? Gonna make me cry again, are ya? Well, uh, turns out... Fucking no. Uh, I have no idea what happened, but somehow it replaced the exploration of human connection and feeling with as many horrible anime tropes as it could. Instead of supernatural being learning what it means to be human, Tushi is now a generic power of friendship shown in protagonist, and the first lol he meets, there's more than one, is a fucking nine-year-old that acts like an adult despite not knowing what sex is when she tells him she wants his babies. There's the dude who wants to fuck him as soon as he turns into a cute girl. There's the flamboyantly gay character that does gay shit, except he's not gay, and the person who was gay for him actually is a girl because, haha, gay people don't really exist. What the fuck happened? I'm appalled, to put it lightly. This is literally everything my channel stands against, and yet I gave this 10 out of 10 and anime of the year. I I'm so offended, I didn't even give it an award. Now, I did prepare this noose award, but it's not for you, it's for me. Before we move on to anime of the year, I need to talk about one more show and it's not getting an award because it's not an anime and we don't normally let their kind in here, but you kind of need to hear about it. It's Netflix's live action adaptation of Alice in Borderland. Yes, live action. Yes, Netflix. Yes, Death Game. Yes, for some reason you put your favorite waifu on a body pillow and no one bats an eye, but as soon as it's one of the babes from a live action adaptation, everyone just looks at you funny. No? Just me? But it's easily one of the best, if not the best, death game story ever made. It's less about the emotional struggle of a death game and more about the logical, philosophical one. What's the point of even trying? Why bother in the cruel death game only to return to yet another one? What's the point of living in the first place? How do you define living? How do you define living? It's the kind of story that makes you feel smarter by watching. One caveat though is that if you watch the entire thing, which you should, it's excellent. You should also go back and read the last few chapters of the manga because the ending is just a little bit different. I don't want to say worse, although I like the manga ending better, especially since the vast majority of the live action is just strictly better than the manga, but it is slightly less of a horrifying mindfuck. Okay, so back to our regularly scheduled programming for anime of the year. Zero, zero, zero. All right, now that we've talked about every anime I watched last year, or at least, you know, every significant one, it's time to choose anime of the year. Too relatable, too obvious, just more of a thing I like. Now, when I think of anime of the year, I think of something that slapped me in the face and completely redefined my expectations of what anime should look like, and there's really only one anime that did that this year. That's right, this year's award goes to the least anime anime of the year, because if my anime of the year last year reminded me of anything, it's that I actually hate anime and only tolerate it because Japan is the only country that considers animation a serious artistic medium. So, congratulations Congratulations on your Anime of the Year award ranking of kings. I hope season two doesn't earn us another noose award next year. So this wraps up the Weeaboo Awards 2022. Please let me know if you enjoyed this new format. If you want to hear more about any of these anime, here is my 2022 playlist. And as always, thank you so much for your time, friends, and I will see you in the next video.